Okay. Now let's get started with our lecture kind of lab for today. So today is going to be all about phylogeny. How many of you guys feel super comfortable with evolutionary trees, phylogeny, reading them, like interpreting them, talking about them? Show of hands of people who are like, I'm into it versus like, I've seen them versus like, uh, because this class is designed to like go through time and go through vertebrate evolution. And a really, 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 really important tool for all of us, is this enough light? Let me know if it's not enough light. Uh, a really important tool for us to use is phylogeny. Phylogeny is an explanation of relationships. It's also a way to test hypotheses. It's an incredibly important thing. And I find that like it's better and better all the time that people getting undergraduate degrees are familiar with phylogeny. They've seen phylogeny or evolutionary trees before, but we really have to get after them. And so I was like kind of open with something like this. So humans have taken the natural world around them and like learned a whole lot about it. But what I like to do is like, imagine yourself, I don't know, 400 years ago or 20,000 years ago, there's still people just like you, a lot longer than that too. And they're surrounded by things like these. They're surrounded by organisms. They're surrounded by biodiversity. Out that window right now that you can see, there are like many, many, many species that I can see right now. How do we get to a point where we understand what those organisms are, we understand kind of how they operate, we understand how they're related to one another, we understand their histories. That's really remarkable. You guys get to like click on Wikipedia or open a textbook or listen to me. And it's kind of like a lot of it understood, but it's really amazing, I think, to imagine early people kind of wondering what is all this stuff? The sort of philosophy of this, all this biodiversity that surrounds us on this planet. And so, you know, at least in the Western canon, Western science, the first people we know who are like trying to kind of like write stuff down in a way where we can like read what they said are unsurprisingly anyway, ancient Greeks. And so you guys probably know Aristotle. Aristotle is this philosopher, right? Plato's his mentor, Socrates before that. So Aristotle is one of these ancient Greeks who's one of the first people to like try to categorize the life around him. And so one part of his life, he went to this island, the island of Lesbos. Some of you might know Lesbos. Uh, and he did a lot of like natural history observation and like documenting. And so that fish right there, that's called a John Dory. That's the kind of fish that Aristotle like drew a picture of and like kind of described to people, which is really interesting. So the first times that happened, Aristotle is one of the first people who absolutely was not the first one to notice, but he's the only one who wrote it down and we know he noticed. Hey, octopuses change color, like they move around and they can like blend into stuff. He's making these observations. One of the really, really fun things I think when we're talking about vertebrates, especially and classification and systematics and phylogeny, is Aristotle one of the first people who tried to build a system for understanding how biodiversity can be categorized? And so this is a kind of a simplification, but it's pretty much what he did. He decided you could call things hot and cold. You could call things wet and dry. So like a fish is wet and it's cold. And like a dog is hot and it's dry. And for a lot of the animals, a lot of the organisms you find on Lesbos, that's pretty straightforward. Dry is not hard, wet is not hard, hot and cold are all not that hard. But one thing I think is really fun, and this is why phylogeny is really important to us now, is there were things that even back then were mysterious. Those are pilot whales. They're a kind of whale that lives in the Mediterranean. Aristotle talked about pilot whales, and he didn't know what to do, because they're wet, but they're also hot. And that you guys can sit here in your chairs and be like, well, right, they're mammals, they're whales. But that's not how it is in ancient Greece. So observations were made way back then that interesting things are different. Most of the wet stuff is cold, but this wet one is hot. I know that sounds dumb, it's supposed to, but like imagine if you've never done it and no one's ever done it before, right? These are these first attempts. And so what's really interesting is that that ancient Greek philosophy, once it gets like rediscovered in the middle ages, and again, I'm mostly talking about like Europe and the history of like us, uh, the Western science of can like canon of science. There's this idea that Aristotle had of like a great chain of being where like people are at the top, in medieval Europe, like people like absolutely staple kings and knights and religion, like on top of all that. And we get these schemes. This is a real thing that's published. This is from 1305. People trying to make sense of the natural world. And a lot of times it's this hierarchy that's a hangover, uh, hung over from Aristotle. And so that one step says plants, and a step up from plants is beasts, and a step up from beasts is people, and it keeps going up to angels and God and all these other things. But it's a hierarchy. So there's categories there. Interesting. It's one way to put it together. This keeps getting uh, evolved over the years. This keeps changing. So here's another published like diversity of life from 1579. I think you'll notice some pretty intense imagery above and below, like the categories of things like plants and animals. 
And to me, I think this is really amazing because this is people trying to make sense of things. Plants are still below beasts, but we've inserted fishes and uh, birds. I don't remember if that's because they're like earlier in Genesis, so they get to go above the beasts. I don't remember. But for some reason, there's people, then there's angels, then there's God. And what's fun is that this just keeps evolving. Here's one from 1754. One of the last times we see one of these like published great chains of being with humans and angels on it. And there's so much more stuff. People are studying, they're writing to each other. They're making notes about the natural world. So now guess what goes above plants? Insects. What goes above insects? Seashells, basically. <laughs> I would love to understand the rationale. I don't think I know it. Uh, it might be in these books. I've never bothered to read these books. <laughs> but you know, snakes go below fishes. It says serpents. It's not like all reptiles. It's snakes go below fishes, then birds, then quadrupeds, then people. But what's interesting is even in this one from 1754, or sorry, 1745, right next to, it's in French, it says homes up here, so humans. But then under that, there's not just humans, there's other things, including orangutans. So orangutans are known in Europe by now, and people are like, well, they go with us. They don't go with the other quadrupeds. So things are getting interesting, right? And we're getting towards the more modern scientific understanding once we get into the 1800s, of course. So you guys are all, for the most part, biologists. And so you probably know this name, Carolus Linnaeus. And so when you come up with like these chains of being where there is like, you know, some sort of supernatural stuff at the bottom and other supernatural stuff at the top, and there's sort of a weird order in the middle that no one can explain, that's still cool because that's people trying their best to make a pattern, to understand it, because it's just all around you all the time. And so this is Linnaeus's Systema Naturae. So 1758, think about that, 1758, George Washington's like fighting Native Americans in Ohio fighting the French, all kinds of cool stuff like that, right? This is getting into the history of this country at this point. But this is over in Europe. This is over in Sweden. And this is Linnaeus's first attempt at like breaking all of life up. And he has the system. The Linnaean taxonomy is still the one we use. We'll talk about it in a second. And so a lot more is known by them. He has this category. You can see at the top there, quadrupedia. So things that are running around on four legs, I think you can probably tell what he means by quadrupedia is what we always say when we usually mean mammals. And so he's got the hooked things together, elephants by themselves, rodents, carnivores, people. Okay. He's got a bird category, aves. That's pretty good, right? And so think about what he's doing at the time. This is based on anatomy. It's based on comparison. He's putting all the like chickeny birds together. He's putting all the cats together. There's an understanding of these bigger categories based on like the anatomy, what you can see amongst these organisms. Here's his Pisces. I think I don't have to translate that for you. I bet you can guess what Pisces means. He's got the shark category and all kinds of other things. Fun things like his amphibia, if you actually squint, his amphibia is frogs and lizards and turtles and snakes, which I'm sure you guys would be like, uh, always a thing. It's a thing that you're going to see in paleontology. It's a thing you're going to see here. People are really good at birds and mammals and like less good if you're not a bird and mammal at figuring out what you are. That's going to happen a lot in this class. But what's really fun is just like Aristotle said, I don't know what this hot, wet animal is when he's talking about whales because all the other wet animals are cold. Linnaeus has all these things in his thing called paradoxes, his system called paradoxes. Some frogs go in paradoxes because they are tadpoles at first and then they're frogs. And so he doesn't know what to call them, which is really fun. There's other things in there that are like mythological creatures. So that's not amazing. But then the other thing that's fun is sloths go with the people, the little anthromorphs, because they look like people. So in his system, sloths are up there with primates because I don't know, they got little cute faces, they got little hands. That's interesting, right? The other one that's truly great and Hang, like hauls hold, back to Aristotle is in his Pisces category, his fish category, he's got dolphins and manatees. So he knows about dolphins and manatees at this point, and he doesn't put them with the mammals, he puts them with the fishes. They look like fish. Look at that shark and that dolphin are next to each other. You're going to put that dolphin over there with the tiger? That feels weird. No, I guess it's a fish. So it's very cool to me that these old systems like reflect increasingly refined knowledge, but then also like uh, kind of problems. And so here's some Linnaean stuff that we've inherited that you guys have heard probably your whole life since you've been in any biology class. Even maybe in elementary school, you heard these things. Kingdom and phylum and class and order and family and genus and species. That's Linnaean taxonomy. That's Linnaeus trying his best to put in order. Now the thing about this is these are all nested categories, like definitional things. If you're a triceratops, and so there's a pretty picture of a triceratops just because, come on, dinosaurs. Um, a triceratops goes in the family Ceratopsidae, and Ceratopsidae goes in the order Ornithischia. And all these things are sort of like very important. Like they exist as these boxes and it's hard to like put boxes halfway on top of other boxes. These categories are hierarchical. You go inside what's above you. 
And that leads to all kinds of weird issues when you get to certain clades, certain groups of organisms like reptilia. But anyway, we still have these words. These words still have a utility. They still do reflect a hierarchy. All those words for Triceratops are absolutely completely fine. They're totally right. Triceratops is absolutely an animal. It's absolutely a coordinate. It's absolutely a reptile, whatever that means. So it's still okay, but we're gonna see here in a second that there's some issues with it. And so I don't have to tell you guys that like everything kind of changes in the 1800s. In the 1850s, Darwin and also Alfred Russell Wallace published this idea of evolution. Species are changing over time. And that's descent with modification. Natural selection is acting on some individuals better than others. Others are having better reproduction. Their reproductive success means that descendants are a little bit different. And if you give that enough time, and it's only the 1800s when we first really realized that the earth is super, super older than we thought, that all of a sudden, maybe all this diversity around us is explained by phenomena like that. And so you guys have heard this anytime you've been in a biology class, right? Something as simple as that. All biological evolution is heritable characteristics, getting selected for over successive generations. What's cool is like Darwin thought about things like phylogeny, where like if things are related, they're not just like this box and then this box, like this is birds and this is reptiles. They have to be related somehow. And this is one of his really cool drawings where he's saying like, here's all these species we maybe have today. And these are all these imagined time periods if you go back in the layers of rock of the earth. And so maybe there's these other ones in the past, maybe there's fewer in the past, and then through history, they're evolving and radiating. But you can see a lot of those lines go extinct. They don't make it to the present. And this is like a pretty crazy idea, right? The idea of extinction is one that's relatively new in Darwin's lifetime. So the whole idea that like, not only are things changing into other things, but there's things that happened and lived and died, and we don't see them anymore. So these ideas are all getting integrated. And so that kind of descent with modification is Darwin's idea. That idea does not really jive with 1700s categories. Because now there's like a continuity between things. There's not these fish category and mammal category. There's obviously a common ancestor between some fish and mammals. That's interesting. That's challenging. And so today, people try their best to kind of take those Linnaean taxonomy names and overlay them on phylogeny, which in the modern world are hilariously detailed. We know a lot. And so you guys have seen things like this before. This is like a cartoon diagram from like a middle school biology textbook. So I know you know this. I'm going to stop blabbing. I do not like blabbing at you guys. You're very uninterrupted. So do me a favor. Talk to the people around you. I'm sure you know, but talk about this. What is this pizza slice rainbow thing trying to show you? Uh, just discuss it for a few minutes, please. Oh yeah, I need to introduce myself. I never even I'm not gonna yeah, you know, and I, I'm still trying to infer what you just said. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, well, it's a domain. Showing everything is up. Yeah, kind of tricks the bias. Or like, what's the all the things? And everything was included with the libraries. Where are you? And the funny one, the whole character would be just up there. Yeah, and it's like a simplified <laughs> version of it, you know, instead of having these trees that branch off and like, you know, like, in middle school, like, you know, you might look at this. Yeah, and if you don't know, it's like, you're it doesn't matter. Yeah. 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 All right, anybody want to tell what your group chatting about? I'm not looking for any one particular thing. I have a couple ideas. This is meant to be too complicated. <laughs> yeah, yes. Um, you know, it's much like what what you said. This is a very uh, 
you know, you know, like this is like a pizza slice that you'd find in a middle school textbook, you know, and in other words, it's very simplified. It's a very simplified taxonomy um, for people of that greater age to understand or that the general population could could look at. And well, and also see. I'm going to say it doesn't do you a disservice, even if you're like a college biology student, but like just, you know, take it in for a second. You can ask deeper questions, too. Right. Like this is this is cartoony. And so, yes. It might be straightforward. What are the things people talking about? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So we're talking about sure. how uh, these specific eight categories are kind of old fashioned. How do you mean? There's actually a, a, like a lot more than you, and you can like just create as many as you want. So that's one of the things we really are trying to get going to get after is like you guys might know about chordates, animals that have a, a notochord, pretty much a vertebra, but not quite. But once you get inside there. There's a ton of stuff. It's not like, boom, the next step is mammals. There's a lot of like in between there that if you're trying to get a really holistic understanding, a real accurate understanding of Earth history, that is extremely useful, but it's also very, very, very limited. And so here's an example of what I mean when I say overlaying. So this was another figure I found that had carnivorans in it. So carnivora is an order of mammals. You guys know them, dogs and cats and seals and raccoons and all that kind of stuff. And so here are some genus, family, species, order kind of stuff. Talk to your neighbors about this. Uh, what issues do you see with like labeling things when it comes to this little phylogeny? Yeah, it's not very specific. Because, like, there's many different types of right? But I guess, you know. Yeah, I mean, it's All right, so does any group see, like, an issue or some limitation here if we're trying to label everything and understand everything? Which one are you talking? Yeah, what are you talking about? Oh, I was just saying like the divergent. Yeah, which one? Well, right at the beginning, you don't know what what the reason is. Oh, with the, well, what the reason is? Sure, sure, that's true. We'll, we'll we'll always maybe be looking for reasons, right, for the tree to split. Well, is that I, what were you guys talking about? So like. Felids and Macellids and Canids are all carnivorans. That's true. These two animals are both in the same genus. That's cool. These two animals are different genera, but they're both in the same family. That's cool. But I think you're kind of getting it. Anybody else see something that they have a wondering about? Very subtle. Yeah, go ahead, sir. Right, so you got that name carnivora. Not everything there is a carnivore, and there are carnivores that aren't in it. Oh, well, that's of course true. We're never going to have a phylogeny. Thank you. You're right, of course. Uh, carnivora is a name. It does not mean you have to eat meat. There's pandas that are eating bamboo all day, and they're definitely still carnivore wrens. By the way, snakes have lost all their legs. Snakes are technically tetrapods, even though they have no legs at all. <laughs> so it's still that that is something that we're going to see a lot of. So you're, you are right. But I'm actually thinking about this. Carnivore is right there. But what about this? Yeah, that's what I thought you guys might have been talking about. There's something real here. Macellids and canids go together to the exclusion of felids. So I could just say weasels and dogs go together to the exclusion of cats. And if you just have these categories, that's not something that's very easy to talk about. What do you call the dog weasel group that isn't the cats in carnivore? Maybe you don't know. How would you know? This system, this is what I mean when I say lane categories are limited. Because by the way, there's about 50 million little nodes, little splits in the tree of life. And if we only name the ones that we decide, and by the way, humans are just deciding which ones are orders and which ones are families versus others. That's why this is a little bit messy. It's nearly interesting. And so here's like an example that's like another sort of problem with these categories. Here's uh, six animals. I'm sure you recognize most of them, maybe all of them. <laughs> and so there's ways we can talk about these animals and what they're related to, what they represent maybe on a phylogeny. And so here's how they're related. I would bet you a million dollars. This is their evolutionary relationships relative to one another, those six animals. We're gonna learn to read these trees later in lab today. So if you just see that, you're like, uh, that's okay. 
here's these six animals. That's how they're related to one another. I'm cool with these two labels. Are you guys cool with those two labels? Mammals, the fox is a mammal. The kingfisher is a bird, great. But all these things are that. That doesn't feel very nice. The snake and the dinosaur and the crocodile and the turtle are this thing called reptiles. And under that Linnaean hierarchy, mammals and birds and reptiles are these things. When you learn about animals when you're four years old, it's like there's five kinds of animals. There's fish and there's amphibians and there's reptiles. That's not very accurate, very helpful, especially if looking at the history of life on Earth. And so a different way to do it, and the way all biologists do it today, and the way we're absolutely going to do it in this class, the relationships are still the same, and a lot of these words are actually still the same, but we use them differently. So reptilia is a taxon. It's a node on the tree of life. We can call the common ancestor of all five of these things. All their branches come back to this point. We can put a little dot on there as humans and say that's what we call reptilia. And then everything after that node is by definition a reptile. That is how it works these days. There's other nodes within there that don't make sense, or they don't not make sense, they don't have a place in the like Linnaean hierarchy. So archosaurs, we know that crocodiles and birds are each other's closest relatives. Crocodiles are not closely related to lizards or turtles other than birds. Crocodiles go with birds. We know that from anatomy, we know that from DNA. That seems really cool. How do I talk about that relationship? Because the crocodile shouldn't be in the reptile bin with the turtles and the lizards all the time. In terms of its heritage, it actually is related to birds. Same thing with dinosaurs. You guys have heard probably your whole lives at this point that birds are dinosaurs. That's totally true. Birds are a group of animals within a bigger clade called dinosauria. So all of these things are the labels. Of course, words like birds and, man oh, sorry, amniota is what we call this node way back here. So all reptiles and all mammals are amniotes. They lay their eggs, they have their babies on land. That's what distinguishes them from amphibians, maybe. So it's still all there. Mammals is still totally real. Birds is still totally real. Reptiles is totally real, but reptiles includes things. They're not exclusive to one another. They're stacked in a way that they have like uh, bigger and bigger and bigger categories that are like inclusive. So Birds are dinosaurs, birds are archosaurs, birds are reptiles. They're not a distinct separate thing from reptiles. Does that make sense? Have you seen things like this before? Okay. Now I'm gonna do a little practice uh, phylogeny just in case some of you have exposure, some of you don't. Here's three uh, living organisms, coelacan. So this is this fish that's like a, usually living in relatively deep waters. Trout and cow, I feel like I don't have to explain to you too much. There's a lot of animals I will probably have to explain to you because you'll see them and go, oh, but these ones probably not. Okay, so I want you to talk to your neighbors, please, and explain as best you can using words like common ancestry and whatever else you want to say. What are the hypothesis? What is the hypothesis of the evolutionary relationships being expressed in this tree? Who's related to who, who, whatever, 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 however you want to say it. Talk to your neighbors, put it into words as like a sentence. Go, please. So, uh, yeah, all three of them come we to life at, at the very bottom of the tree. Uh, and it's kind of uh, wherever that, you know, is this thing, you know, or, 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 or trout and sea accounts. Okay, so somebody who somebody we haven't heard from, somebody we haven't heard from yet to represent their group. What is your group talking about? How would you talk about the relationships put in this tree? This tree is a hypothesis. All these trees are hypotheses. What is this one stating? Well, it's saying oh, that. Oh yeah. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. No, no, you're good. You're good. You're good. Let's go ahead. Um, well, it's saying that the coelacanth and the trout share a common ancestor. Okay. And then they both share a common ancestor with the cow. So they all have common ancestry. At the base of this tree, all three of these things are organisms. They're all animals. They're all vertebrates. They're actually all bony vertebrates. So they have a common ancestor. Great. But you're saying the coelacanth and the trout have a more recent common ancestor is what we'd say. So the coelacanth and the trout are more closely related to each other on this tree. That's what this tree is showing you than either is to the cow. People like that, agree with that, understand that, disagree with that, want to change anything? <laughs> okay. What about this one? Talk to each other again. 
And again, this is just a hypothesis. I don't know if this is right. I don't know if the first one's right. This is just a hypothesis. What is this tree saying? Is the relationship? Yes. <laughs> Somebody hasn't spoke up yet. Yes. Listen. So everybody still has a common ancestor. They all share. That's very nice. The trout's not floating out in space. But this time, the cow and the coelacanth have more recent common ancestors that they share to the exclusion of the trout. So they go together, and the trout's their sister group. It's their outgroup. Interesting. Last one. <laughs> See if you could do it. All right, talk to each other. Shouldn't take you very long. All right, what is this one say? Then you guys middle school diagrams making you answer the same question three times in a row it's exactly the same what does this one say yes chrissy the trout more closer to the cow than than the coelacanth okay so you guys any three organisms you can find in the entire world ever a, whatever a chunk of virus a bacterium a redwood tree whatever you want to do virus would be a bad call don't do the virus but there's only three ways three things can be related to one another. Two and one on the outside. That's always true. And so here's three different ways. Here's the three options you get. If you catch a trout and you go to South Africa and you pick up a coelacanth and you go to, uh, to the Karoo and find somebody who's herding cow, you could hold those three organisms and be like, how are you all related? These are the only three choices you get. So here's A, here's B, here's C. Which one do you guys suppose is the actual relationship that we believe based on an absolutely hilarious amount of scientific, ev that scientific evidence. One of these trees, again, I 100% think is right, and the other two I think 100% are wrong. What one do you think it is? Talk to your neighbors. And if you think it's one or the other, I don't care which one you pick, what is the evidence that's supporting why that would be true? So go ahead and chat with each other, please. <laughs> What? So looking at the trout. Oh, okay. So it's not yeah. as uh, yeah. hey, wow. So it's like everything goes in the short the sharp eye for the count. It's the same yeah. weird tiny thing. It's kind of a seed because for a whole lot of fish. Right. So, you know, and they have gills. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yes, they are the trout brace. So they all come like a net. What's the chance of seeing all the stuff you have? Yeah. 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 So that is Oh, I Okay, we're going to do a poll. We're going to do a poll. Be brave. Be brave. Everybody's going to be wrong all the time in this class. It's very fun. I'm wrong a lot. I make these slides and then I click through them on my own. And I go, whoops, and I did it wrong. So, hey. Anybody want to raise their hand because I think A is the reflection of real relationships on Earth. Trout and cow, coelacanth outside. Okay, anybody vote for B? Get behind that. Coelacanth and cow, trout on the outside. Anybody vote for C? I would have been. Look at you guys taking this test like test takers. <laughs> There's no way the fish go together. Why would he ask us that? <laughs> and that's true. This is the right answer this is the historical situation amongst vertebrates this organism looks like this this organism looks like this this organism wears a bell it gets milked and looks like that and that fish and that cow have a more recent common ancestor than either one does to the trout i can tell you that with authority but what i actually care about what i hope you guys have been talking about and i want to hear from you again now what is the evidence this is an outrageous sentence. If you walk up to Aristotle and you're like, I know they're both wet and cold, <laughs> but this one goes with the cow. What are you gonna be able to talk about? What are you gonna be able to show? What is the evidence for this? 
Coelacanths have bones and have fins and they're fleshy and worm like than the trout. Coelacanths are a, certainly. I have no problem with the word fish. Coelacanth are absolutely for sure. Don't get too in your own head. There are fish, but they've got like muscular fins with bones in them. Believe it or not, coelacanths have a humerus like you do. So I'm going to call that comparative anatomy. That's one line of evidence we could use. People have used that for a long time. What other lines of evidence might there be for this relationship? Yeah, Gary. DNA. DNA. You could take that coelacanth's DNA and that trout's DNA and that cow's DNA. Like I said, you can do their mitochondrial genomes. Sorry. You could do their nuclear genomes. You could synthesize that and get an idea of their relationships, and you're going to get that pattern. So DNA, comparative anatomy, what else? Yeah? There are transitional forms. Oh, what are those called? Transitional fossils. Hey, there we go. Fossil, yes, of course. Well, in this class, right, we're going to talk a lot about fossils. It doesn't look very fun when you're looking at these three absolutely living, been evolving for hundreds of millions of years lineages. But there is a moment, you guys are gonna learn the word Devonian next week, when like there's all these fishes that are like flopping around on land for the first time. And you're like, okay, I see the inner cow coming through in the glimmer of your eye. So that's cool, right? There's different lines of evidence. People thinking this a long time ago, or even today as like their expectations, or like any time the museum has a tour of children come through, there's nothing, this is completely reasonable. What's cool is this is what the evidence tells us. That's fun. Congratulations to those of you who picked cow trout because I feel like you threw the dart and you knew. <laughs> anyway, so that's fun. That's really fun. Simple question. Are these trees the same or not? Talk to each other. Oh. <laughs> I don't mean the same, like find the difference, because obviously they're laughing. <laughs> I mean the information contained. Oh, yeah, yeah. I guess it could be straight there. <laughs> All right, who says yes? Yes. Who says no? Anybody say no? Yes, they definitely are. So nodes can spin. As long as the pattern of relationships is maintained, trees can be looking lots of different ways. Don't let yourself get tricked. Something that happens to students a lot is they look at the top line, usually because a lot of trees that are simplified have like a pattern to them where the thing they want you to notice is like this way. That's not necessarily always true. The relationships are what count. If trout, oh sorry, if silicon and the cow go together in both, and then trout's the outgroup in both, sister in both, same tree, same kind of thing. Okay, that's all. What I want to point out to you guys, though, is when we talk about phylogenies, this is where like you can really nerd out as a biologist. It's really crazy that we're going to be able to, in this class, just blitz our way through so many of these things because the information that's in them and what they're really representing that's happening like out there on that hillside that I can see where there's living and evolving bugs and mammals and flowers like right now. A lot of them are dormant because it's winter. But this is happening all the time. You can think about evolution. Think about when you're learning about like gene flow and migration and all these things from like intro bio, like how evolution works. Populations of organisms are kind of evolving through time. And so there's like kind of these things that look like rivers. You guys ever seen like these complicated rivers with like sandbars in the middle? Think of those as like the gene pool through time. This population's by itself for a while before it joins back up. Maybe it never joins back up and it's its own species. Real world stuff is super, super, super messy. And so I really love figures like this. Because we could talk about how A, B, C, and D are related to one another, but if we maybe had a real, which we'll never have this, but if we ever had like a real full rendering of every individual that ever lived in these groups of organisms, this might be what their populations looked like through time. Who knows what's on this y-axis or x-axis here? Maybe it's like, you know, how tall you are or whatever. But like this like version of evolution, drifting, populations that go off on their own and ultimately go extinct, populations that split and now there's two species. That's what life's really doing all the time. That's how messy it really is. And if you zoom in, you can see that like flowing gene pools. But in a textbook, we're just gonna show you that. And so those lines are really easy to draw. You go, <laughs> I always think it's like, take a breath, <laughs> put yourself as like one of these organisms in one of these populations, one of these gene pools evolving through time. Something I really like you guys to know is like, especially modern phylogenetics, like we're gonna talk a lot about paleontology where it's gonna be like, how many teeth does it have? Is this bone touching that bone? Because that's the information that's in fossils. 
But people who do phylogeny, mostly biologists in this building who do phylogeny, they're working with whole genomes. They're working with like literally thousands and thousands of lines of independent evidence to test relationships. This is a gorgeous phylogeny of butterflies. This is not a class where we're going to talk about butterflies very much. All those different colored lines, those lines are, or sorry, the colors are representing the different clades, relationships among the butterflies that are found. But the reason there's like a haze there with like a tree drawn on top of it is that's like if you sequence this gene, if you sequence that gene, if you sequence this other gene. And so, of course, for the, all these butterflies, you can sequence thousands of genes. And you might get like mostly the correct, most likely relationships. But you can see some of these trees show different kinds of relationships. And the whole point is life is really messy. And all of us humans are always just trying our best to like, get it straight. We're still being Linnaean. We're still being like Aristotle. We still want a nice box. We can talk about how genomes are complicated. But I think it's cool for you guys to see like these black lines here probably really do represent truly in a simplistic way how those butterflies are related to one another. But individual gene histories in those evolving butterfly populations are a mess. And I just think that's so cool because this class again is going to be all how many teeth does it have? And does this bone touch that bone? And that's real data. That's super important. But it's incredible what modern biologists can do with phylogenies. This is another really classic figure that's kind of showing the same thing uh, that I just talked about there on the upper left. So you're seeing populations evolving through time here, these light gray. And then there's these islands, you know, times where if you imagine at this time slice or at this time slice, maybe we have a rock level and we can find fossils. Maybe at this time slice, we have a rock, a rock level where we can find fossils. And you're going to see different things. But even with a really good fossil record, you're not going to capture all that like beautiful, chaotic craziness. I just like to emphasize this because we're about to draw about 10,000 lines in this class and be really confident about all of them. It's always like good to take a breath and be like, whoa, it's a mess. OK, what we're going to do now for the next quite big chunk of time is I want you guys to get in groups of like three as best you can. Three is good. Try. If it doesn't work out, we'll work on it. I'm going to pass these out. We're going to spend the next quite a bit of time working on this. 20 minutes at least. Half an hour. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm doing this recklessly. If you're coming, you're going to be like, I didn't get one. Uh, fine. Okay. Spares are done. So what you guys are seeing on this worksheet on one side is a big old phylogeny. We lost need one. Okay. On one side of this phylogeny, or sorry, one side of this worksheet is this big old phylogeny. This is a uh bony fish, lobe fin fish phylogeny. So coelacanther right here. Another kind of fish is right here. And then these are all the animals today that have four legs and run around, turtles, crocodiles, mammals, birds. Okay. On the bottom of this uh, page is a timeline with geological history. There's some fossil organisms on here. And these are the relationships for the most part I'm comfortable with. So you guys can just use this as your template. And on the back, you can talk to each other. You're not by yourself. This is called the refresher. Because some of you might be like, oh, I took a class. I've learned these things before. Some of you might be like, I don't know what that is. That is okay. So all we're going to do is, as best we can in groups, work through this. If you don't know something, definitely fine. But you can use this thing on the back to circle stuff and do things. Okay, I'll stop talking. Okay. Um, <laughs> I 
This is all of our guys. But it could also be
Yeah, it's also kind of a Here. Where the derived character is like here. 
Okay, I'm going to try to pull you guys back here. So uh, this worksheet, what you guys just, what I, how about this? What I just subjected you to is like one of the ways I have found is really interesting to try to get this conversation started. Because you might be able to tell some people in this classroom are like, I've had this in other classes before. This means this. I remember that one. This one means this. Other people, what is all this? And it's super unfair. Well, so that's, I'm not collecting this. These are for you to take notes. All these slides will be posted. All these terms will be defined. But it's a really interesting thing. Also, you might care to know in like the education literature that if you hold something and struggle with it and start to be like, ah, but I made a couple guesses, you are going to have learned from that awful process you just went through, <laughs> feeling like you were throwing spaghetti at the wall, trying to make sense of what I was asking. So I know it was mixed backgrounds here. That's kind of the whole point. So before we go over this worksheet, I want to switch gears just a little bit. Here's all your guys' favorite stuff that you told me about on day one. So go ahead and talk to your neighbors. Which ones are yours? Why do you like them? I did organize them too, but don't worry about it. <laughs> Which part? <laughs> well, um, me and I got a lot of No, they look at both the Okay. Um, did you put in like, yeah. you know, uh, the boys that's asked it by like, okay, anybody have anything they want to share? Anything they're noticing? Anything they're like, I don't know what that one is. By the way, great, great biodiversity, you guys. And also one of the only classes I've ever had where someone didn't write like my mom or my boyfriend <laughs> and like a human has to be on the slide. Every class I've ever taught, someone's written like my girlfriend or something like that. No Good for you. I would have accepted human, but none of you said it, so I like that more. Okay. Any questions? Anything you want to share? Why you like your things? Yes, Chrissy? I just have a question about what's the meatball with an animal that's right next to the Who put the meatball? <laughs> Who put pica? You did, and you put it as an extra. Yeah, I did. <laughs> There was like a whole list of three and three, and then she was like, and, uh, and pika too. And I was like, well, no, I'm putting pika on there. Pika are related to rabbits. They live around here. They're in Idaho. Uh, you can see them. They live in the mountains. They professionally collect flowers all summer and make a giant flower pile that they live on all winter. Extremely cute. Extremely sorry to say, susceptible to climate change. They do not like it too warm, and so they're constantly being driven up mountains. But go to the Tetons. Go to the Sawtooth. You'll find some pika. Any other things people want to share out? Yes, Jacqueline. In between the blue and green fish and the stingray, there's like this blob, and I don't know what it is. What's this blob? Yeah. Sea dragon. Sea dragon. What's a sea dragon? Who put sea dragons? I did. I thought you might have said, yeah. So tell us about sea dragons. Oh, they're awesome. They live down. End of sentence. <laughs> okay, no, throw up one. They're what? Live down in Australia. Um, they're related to seahorses, pipefish. Um, so they have those really long, thin snouts to suck in little critters. If you delete all the green frilly stuff, you can see it's a seahorse. Yeah, I guess. But they're camouflaged like seaweed. They just live in the seaweed, and you don't see them. That's also a vertebrate, just as much as you or T. Rex. <laughs> that sea dragon. 
Great biodiversity, by the way, you guys. Lots of good plants. I wasn't surprised, but good plants. A couple good invertebrates. Who put the calcid wasp? What? Yeah, super did. So this little this little wasp. I had to go find that one. I didn't have that one already. Yeah, calcid wasp. That's funny. Okay. Uh, great job, you guys. Love, love the biodiversity. Lots of fun stuff to talk about. And I'd like to break you away from that worksheet for a second, because the worksheet might make you stressed and be like, wow. And so this is why we're doing this. Also, by the way, kudos to you guys on excellent extinct organisms. This is what you guys brought to this class when it said, uh, what are my favorite extinct organisms? Uh, these are the animals you're going to see probably more of this semester. Uh, just like we just did, talk to your neighbors for a second. Uh, tell us about these extinct organisms. Which ones are yours? Which ones are you like, what is that? No, 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 no. I yeah, like nowadays. Like, All right, anybody have anything they want to share? Anything they wonder about? Same as before. You guys know all these organisms? You're like, I get it. Next. <laughs> oh, I wouldn't say, you know, no more. There's some true celebs on here, as well as some true randos. Is that a philosopher below this? Yes. Yes, it is, Gary. I did not put the There's a thalatosaur. Who put the thalatosaur? Someone wrote it out all the way, so you did put it. <laughs> Elucigenia is this one. <laughs> Somebody put the thalatosaur. Who was it? It might have been you. It might have been you? Excellent. Fantastic. So you guys are going to hear about these in a, like a month and a half for two seconds. <laughs> But these are these little reptiles that are one of the first reptile lineages to adapt to living in the oceans. So it's getting little paddle feet. Super not long lived. So Hannah, thank you for early thalatosaurs. What else? I'm pretty sure you guys see some real celebrities on here, right? You can see the cast of Ice Age. You can see multiple Jurassic Park animals. You can see, I mean, a lot of this stuff is pretty predictable. Great number of pterosaurs, four different kinds of pterodactyl. You guys were very specific about your pterodactyls. That was nice. Didn't expect that. Yeah, pterosaur. Yeah, yeah. Same, same thing. Same thing. All right. Well, I'm sure you can see there's dinosaurs. There's ice age stuff. Two people put weird plants I haven't met yet. I don't know who put that. You put yeah, weird plants I haven't met yet. So this is a lineage of seed plants called Beninatales that totally goes extinct. I think in the Jurassic. So I was like, well, <laughs> there's a weird plant you've never met. Okay, that's all just for fun. Some of these animals are hundreds of millions of years old. Some of these animals died super, super recently. It's very different. Every, uh, the last couple times I've taught a class and asked students their favorite extinct organisms, I've had multiple students write the banana species that banana flavoring comes from, <laughs> which is true, that is extinct. So I had to go find a banana picture, but pretty funny. Different kinds of extinction, right? Some of these are from an asteroid impact, some of these are by people, some of these are just normal organisms being organisms. Okay, so, all that to say, there's your guys' organisms. I really appreciate you telling me that. I like building our conversations off of what you guys think and what you guys like. So what we're gonna do now is treat that worksheet uh, as a template. And here's a phylogeny of some of your favorite organisms. And what you guys are gonna do Go ahead and take it in. There's your favorite organisms. Not all of them, just a few of them, mostly vertebrates. And arranged accurately, I'm going to say, this is their real evolutionary relationships as we understand them right now. So talk to your neighbors. 
See if you understand what's going on up here and think about all those questions. Circle a node, circle a monophyletic group. Where would a character go? What's a good character? We're gonna use this as a class to kind of go through the worksheet instead of the one on the back there. Let's go ahead and talk to each other. You're all gonna get a chance. Everyone from every group is gonna come up and put something on the board. So talk about it. <laughs> it's a lot to read. I'll let you read it for a minute first. They are very close standards. Other mammals. So I'm going to give you guys a little more structure up here. Uh, what are we talking about? What are we observing and being like, uh, or like, oh, I knew that one. Or like, oh, I didn't know what? Like, where we, what are we talking about? I'm hearing it, but I want to. I can look at stuff like this all day because I just think it's great. <laughs> I hope this prompts your questions because then you're like, wait a minute. So, hmm, what are we talking about? I heard you guys talking about. I was having like a mental breakdown. Mental breakdown, good. That's what I'm looking for. <laughs> Tell me more. The whale elk relationship. So, you guys remember cow seal can't trout. Well, here's whale elk rhino. I bet my life on it. That's the deal. <laughs> the elk and the whale. Boop. And then the rhino, and then these other things, and then blah, 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 blah. What are you going to have to see to believe this? You don't have to answer, but you can think about it. What else? Yeah. Yeah, I, there weren't too many invertebrates. Like, So this is pretty unfair. By the way, these are invertebrates too, right? Sagebrush and aspen don't have backbones. But anyway. <laughs> Tardigrade and the bee and the octopus. There's only three invertebrates I use. So these are how those three go together. Sure. There are millions of species that should go in here to fill this out. But of these three, that's how they go. What else? Anybody feel like they can label? Like we could put a label on here and be really confident about it? Yeah, what labels would you be confident in? Where would you be like, eh, that's what those are. Aren't you carry out at the bottom? Whoa, you carry out at the bottom. Agree, disagree? <laughs> so I'll do a little bit of work here for you guys, just to build some structure here. You can do that. Eukarya, love that. What else? You can do Fordata or Vertebrata. Uh, or, and I mean another one that we don't know yet. So where are the vertebrates on this tree? This is vertebrate paleontology. Charles. Sharks and up. You guys know I could spin this around, right? And put like the owl on this far side and it would still be valid. But anyway, yes, sharks and this way. So what do you mean? Like, where would I put the dot? Uh, down. So the common ancestor of these three fishes that are cartilaginous right here with all these animals that have bones. Right down here, I think that's totally cool. We could write Vertebrata. So that node is vertebrates. Everything after that is a vertebrate for sure. Let me give, let's get one more. What's another one you guys are like, I'm confident? Oh, come on. Some of these up there, you, I know you guys know some of these. Tetrapoda? Tetrapoda. Where would we put tetrapoda? So tetrapoda is animals with four limbs. I've got four. Frogs. Frogs and? Everything else. Frogs and everything else? Yeah. So sea turtles are tetrapods? Dogs? 
whales? <laughs> yes, they are. <laughs> they don't have four legs anymore. But we could do that. OK, great. So now that there's a little bit of structure on here, talk to your neighbors, talk to each other again. If you're going to have to circle eight different things up here in front of the class, which ones are you going to circle? OK, go for it. Mm -hmm. Talk to each other again. As far as uh, as far as like those names that so yeah, after I would put like I know yeah, I'm going to go to the next one. I'm going to go to The way we did it was as a line. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, so how do we feel about uh, our friends? I don't know. We're excluded. No, so yeah, we're going to say this. Our parapolis is like, you almost just said That's great. That's all I can ask. Excluding all the other ones, we had the yeah. share columns. Those are right here for the product. But mm -hmm. we're excluding all the ones. Oh my goodness! Okay. Let's see how it goes. Okay. Uh, let's just go through some of these. Uh, we'll have the slides up in a second, which has all of them. But there's just a few. Which group did tax on? Okay, this group here. What did you guys circle? Elk. Elk. Oh my gosh! Of all people, this guy loves elk. By the way, <laughs> he loves elk. So elk is circled as a tax on. Yes, of course. Any of these things, any of these labels, any of these, what we call these are operational taxonomic units. You never have to say that. These are all taxa, but also tetrapoda is a taxon. Vertebrata is a taxon. It's one of the labels we put on the phylogeny. It doesn't mean anything special structurally on the diagram. It's the names of different groups of organisms is a taxon. Even if it's one we don't use anymore, we still say taxon. Okay, so which, one, which group did the lineage? Okay, what, what, what did you draw up here? Uh, we drew the line from uh, Eukarya all the way up to Octopus. Oh, okay, so tell me about it. So it's uh, from lineage ancestry descent. <laughs> so the lineage, right? So you guys can think about this. Like, imagine, right, if you zoom, 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 zoom in on this line, there's this evolving gene pools, the common ancestor that's leaning at any one of these nodes. So I would call this right here, this line right here, the octopus lineage. But then after this, this is no longer the octopus's only lineage. Here's the common ancestor between these invertebrates, this animal. If you guys watched those lectures from two weeks ago that I posted online, this is like that uh, protostome lineage that goes back really far. Here's it joins with these animals. This is that bilaterian node. Here's the bilaterian lineage. So the lineage is just this, this the, the going through time. 
And there's tons of different scales for that. Okay. Uh, who did no? What group did no? Yes, what did you guys circle? Tetrapoda. Tetrapoda, a node. A node is a place where the tree splits. We usually can put a label there. So tetrapoda is a taxon. It labels the node. This node, I didn't ask anybody to do this, is like a speciation event. It is cladogenesis. There's now two clades. This one's going to be amphibians. This one's going to be amniotes. Tetrapods is the node. Tetrapod is a split. All those words kind of are overlapping each other. Uh, what group did paraphyly? Yes. Tell me about what's your paraphyletic group? We need fish as our paraphyletic group, so we're including the common ancestor of fish, but not including the um, amphibian mammal reptiles. I'm going to make an edit. So you guys see, they they circled these animals, what they would call fish, and so maybe you could circle all of those. Usually, paraphyletic means something like this, where it's like, right. These are all the fishes, and here's all the fish evolutionary history. But the problem, of course, with that is this node, bony fishes like angelfishes or that sleepy sea dragon, have a more recent common ancestor with all those things than either one does with things like sharks and stingrays. So fishes is fine. I'm not going to say fishes isn't real, but it's not evolutionarily accurate. Some of those fishes are more closely related to tetrapods, just like with the coelacanth and the trout. All right, who did a monophyletic group? Yes. What did you guys circle? Um, whale, elk, rhino, that group right there. How do you think you describe a monophyletic group? Okay, if you don't know. Anybody have an idea how they would describe a monophyletic group? By the way, this is also a clade. The word for it, clade. Yeah? They, they all share a common ancestor. It's a common ancestor in all their descendants. That is like the textbook, simple, best possible thing to put into your brain right now. Common ancestor and everything that comes after that counts as part of the group. That's a monophyletic group. So this is a node. It has a taxon that's associated with it. Yep. You won't have to learn this until April, but it's Laurasia theria. <laughs> so there's a clade that has a name there. There's other things here that are related to them, but this is still a clade, a taxon. This is a monophyletic group because it's a common ancestor and everything that comes after it. So there is a, a node right here and a node right here and a node right here that is monophyletic. So what's the name of the group that includes sharks and mammals and sea turtles? There's a name, you guys are gonna learn it later. <laughs> Won't keep going through all this. We have any questions about these basic terms? We're not gonna talk about the parts money stuff or the character stuff right now. Getting it? Seeing it? You can mark it on your tree. If you have something different on your worksheet that you're gonna take home and keep, Maybe change or circle or edit because the same principles are applying to this phylogeny. Okay. There are slides I'll show you here in a second for all these terms. So these are all going to be on Moodle. You can look at them when you want to. Here's like, you know, a very much less fun because it's letters instead of like your favorite animals <laughs> version of all these different terms. I'm not going to be like belaboring you guys with these terms, but you do need to have them. Here's all their definitions. Again, this will be on Moodle. You're never going to be like really, really put to the test on these, right? Here's what a monophyletic clade is, a common ancestor and all of its descendants. Birds is a great example of a monophyletic clade. When this tree was up there and I was asking you guys, what could you name? I thought one of you was gonna be like, well, those are all birds. And maybe you'd be like, right? It's like, yes, birds is a great example of a monophyletic clade. And things like we just talked about, paraphyly. So this group over here circled the fishes. Paraphyly sounds like monophyly, but a really important difference. A common ancestor, yes, but not all of its descendants. If you have a common ancestor for all the reptiles, but then you say not birds, that's a paraphyletic group. Reptilia is monophyletic if you include birds. There are a bunch of very sassy people, if you guys go on like Instagram and stuff, who are like, we're all fish. Like that's their shirt. Because yes, technically, we are all very, very, very specialized kinds of fish. That's true. Uh, but anyway, usually not helpful for talking to people because then they just are like. Okay, so there's the terms. You guys have these slides. I know this has been kind of a slog for a second. So we're gonna take our break, stand up, stretch, five minutes. Do whatever you want, and we'll come back and keep going.
Is this the fish within a fish by fixing this as well? Perfect. Yes, it is. <laughs> like, I think I see another. Uh, another fish. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, it looks like most people are kind of back. We're kind of back. So we'll jump here into the second part of class, second half of class here today, getting into phylogeny, getting you guys kind of brushed up on looking at this stuff. So let's jump into it. So, okay, I asked you guys about characters. So anytime anybody, anytime anybody shows you any scientific data, they think this thing is true. As scientists, what I hope is true for you guys is that you then want to know, like, what makes you say that? How do you know that? I'm going to show you so many phylogeny. I'm not going to display every single one in detail, but I want you guys to always know that if you're like, that doesn't make sense. I don't get that. Is that really how that works? 
ask because there are data behind these ideas. Any good defensible scientific idea needs to have data behind it. And so when we do phylogeny, we talk about characters, really simple things. They can be really simple, they can be really complicated. Features of the organism, that's a character. You guys have four limbs, right? Two hind limbs, two forelimbs. Four limbs is a character for a clade, tetrapoda. Any tetrapod has these four limbs. And so some of these are really simple, some of them are not. One question I asked you guys is, what makes a good character? Maybe you didn't know what a character was, but I heard some people talking about characters. So what might make a good character? One that's helpful for determining relationships. What were you guys talking about? If you got there, maybe nobody got there. Yeah, hand? Unique, but not too unique. Oh, so what's the example of unique, but not too unique? Well, like unique, but shared by descendants, which obviously, so like limbs. Right. They, you know, are attributed to Certain organisms, but not all. Certain organisms, not all. So how about like, uh, oh, look at this. Auto advancing, I did not mean that. <laughs> so variable among taxa. So um, something that you can look at in a bunch of different organisms, and some have this, some have that. Maybe some don't have the thing you're talking about. There's something there to act on. So one thing that's always going to be important about phylogenies and characters is these relative terms. So we might say a character state. You have legs, you don't have legs. We might say one of those is ancestral, the old way to say this, which is not really what we say anymore. The primitive condition is like no legs, but derived, the more evolved, the advanced condition is to have legs. We're, we're inferring there the evolution of a character, the evolution of legs. And by the way, legs is really a gigantic anatomical structure that has thousands of characters, but you get what I'm saying. These are relative terms. If you're talking about all these fishes and then you have a frog in your phylogeny, legs is really important to set the frog apart. If you're talking about a phylogeny of geckos, whether you have legs or not, maybe is interesting, but probably isn't. There so are there are legless geckos. I realized it as soon as I said it. How about this? A clade of giraffes. <laughs> Who, do you have legs? You do not have legs. It's not very interesting to talk about giraffes without legs because those aren't something that exists. So another thing that has to be true, I really messed up with that gecko thing, oh, is that it's genetically determined, right? These are heritable features. A family, you know, classic example is like, if you guys just work out like crazy and get super swole, your baby's gonna be like, yo, what's up? And like, you're like, Jack, like, that's an environmental thing. That's the thing that you did. I mean, you might wish that's true, but these are genetically things. Environmental characteristics absolutely affect an organism's phenotype. They affect how you adapt, they affect how you survive. But if they're not heritable, they're not acting on by natural selection, they're not gonna be good characters. They might be really good for describing a landscape. They might have value scientifically, but in terms of the evolutionary history, Characters are really good if they're variable and they're genetically determined. And again, there's these relative terms. The polarity of these things goes one way. You know, having feathers is a unique characteristic among some dinosaurs. But by the time you get up into birds, no one's talking about whether you have feathers or not. Feathers is now the ancestral, the old, the primitive condition. Maybe if you lose your feathers as a bird, that's now an advanced condition because you had it, you lost it, right? So a vulture's head is naked. That's an advanced condition. The primitive condition was feathers, but before that, down in reptile evolution, we evolved feathers in the first place. So all these terms kind of like depends on the scale of what you're looking at. So characters are really important. They're how we build these phylogenies. When you guys see a phylogeny, you're probably going to see like the list of taxa, a list of animals or plants, whatever it is across the top. And then the tree is there. And there's probably thousands and thousands of observations. Yes, no. Or like looking at the genes, looking at the base pairs in the genes, the structure of the DNA. What's the structure? And then comparing it, getting it quantified. That's how we make these trees with these characters. So anytime I show you a relationship, ask about it if it doesn't make sense to you. So let's practice here. Let's practice trying to observe characters. Here's to, uh, I'm going to say animals. <laughs> doesn't matter what they are. Uh, one's called Triceratops. One's uh, called a Turco. I won't say anything more than that. Talk to each other. If you're going to try to figure out things about these organisms that they might share with each other. What are you observing? What do they share? What do you think they share because they both evolved it differently? What do you think they share because they inherited it from their common ancestor? We're just gonna be making observations here, not looking for anything in particular. Talk to your neighbors about these two organisms. Yeah, 
All right, I've overheard I've overheard three things that make me want to say I am not looking for anything in particular. There's no like little cute story I'm waiting for you guys to pick up on. There's not. I care about observations about each on its own. I care about comparing them to each other. And then if you do compare them to each other, you think they're totally different or the, are they the same? Are the ways they're the same? Do they independently evolve those states? Do you think? How would you figure it out if that's true or not? Or do they look the same in some way? Or have something that's the same? Because they inherited it from their common ancestors. So again, I'm gonna ask you the same question. How would you figure out one way or the other? Okay. Okay, I've heard lots of good stuff. So what are some what are some features that would be interesting to talk about here? What are we talking about? That's all I care about. What are you guys talking about? What? A beak. Anybody else talk about beaks? What's a beak? Oh, is this a beak? I'm gonna, I'm gonna say no. <laughs> yeah. So what's a beak? You don't have to know necessarily. But tip of mouth, keratin covering. Most of the time, you have two. Okay. Oh, a tip of the mouth, keratin covering. That's an idea, right? That's very anatomical, like keratin in your fingernails. Usually, no teeth. I accept that. There's plenty of beaks, teeth, teeth. Plenty of beaks with teeth out there in the past. None today. So this animal, I think, has that kind of a structure. Its mouth is covered with keratin. It's very pretty. There's no teeth in its mouth. I think we can all say a beak. Triceratops absolutely has a beak in the front of its face. It's got a really huge amount of teeth back here, but in the front of its face, it has a beak. So do these animals have a beak because they've inherited a beak from their common ancestor? That's one observation. One, sorry, one hypothesis we can have of our observation of beak, beak, or they both independently evolved a beak. Both of those are interesting 
for different reasons. So talk to each other for a second. How would you determine if the beak between a bird and a triceratops is inherited from the common ancestor or if they both did it on their own? Talk to each other. How would you figure that out? <laughs> <laughs> All right, what are some strategies we could use? What are some lines of evidence we could try to follow to get after this, to help us choose? Fossils. Fossils, sure. What are we going to look for? Going back and finding their uh, like evolutionary history to see where they have a common ancestor and if that common ancestor had a beak. Okay, so maybe if you think you if you think this think about how high level that is, you're going to interpret thousands and thousands and thousands of other organisms. <laughs> think maybe you have the common ancestor of Triceratops in this bird, and see if that thing has a beak. You could look for that. What other things could you do? That's a whole. That is a lot of work. It's not wrong. It's a lot of work. What else could you do? Find the earliest ancestors of birds and see if those have a beak. So, do you guys think? What about a different question? Do you think every bird species evolved its beak independently, or did birds have beaks because they all had beaks they inherited from a common ancestor? Just don't even worry about fossils right now. What would you say to that? Think about your Aristotle, and you think the world's not that old, and you just see a bunch of birds. They all independently evolved beaks. Well, you don't even think about it as evolution. They all have beaks because they have a common ancestor that has beaks, or they all have beaks because they each independently evolved a beak and lost all their teeth. Yeah, so you guys are taking it for granted, really, because you already know the modern world that all birds have beaks. And I can see that out in the modern world today. There's no birds with teeth. What's cool is if we go back into the fossil record, which is one thing we could do, we'll eventually start to see uh, these things don't have beaks, or they do have beaks, and there's definitely teeth in them. And then eventually this thing looks like a bird and has all these bird features, and it's got a mouthful of teeth, and there's no beak at all. So there's really good evidence out there that birds evolved their beaks way before, if you're going back in time, the common ancestors they have with triceratops. So a really good idea that then you could test with more evidence is that this animal has a beak and this animal has a beak and they evolve them independently from them. That's possible, that's cool. Who thinks they know or what, who talked about a feature that you're like, these animals share this feature and I definitely think they got it from a common ancestor. Yeah, yeah Jack. Their eyeballs, what do we think? Birds and dinosaurs and birds and dinosaurs like this one evolved eyes by themselves or they inherited their eyes from a common ancestor. Okay. What what's a what's a way we could get evidence for that? Well, I mean, most of the time I do not preserve in the fossil record. Yeah, so maybe fossils aren't that great. Fossils are a bunch of skulls with no eyeballs in them. There's holes where you're like, I bet there's an eyeball there. We but have, there's not an eyeball. We do not have direct evidence that Triceratops had eyeballs. If you want to get really like sort of like whoa dude in the dorm room, that's true. We don't know if Triceratops had eyeballs. That's fair. That's fair. <laughs> We can make a really strong inference that it did. How about if you just look around at all the other organisms? All the birds and all the reptiles and all the mammals and all the fishes, and actually a lot of the invertebrates kind of in different ways, so that's weird. But almost everybody has eyeballs. So I think my, especially vertebrate eyeballs, vertebrate eyeballs, based on the modern world, I might expect to be a really ancient thing. Of course, then I can look in fossils, see if there's holes inside the skull, but there are always two holes right here. I bet these things have eyeballs. So I agree, the eyeballs are shared, the eyeballs are a shared derived character at some point, and they're definitely not unique to these two. Your eyeballs are also shared from common ancestry with these two reptiles' eyeballs. They were the fish's eyeballs. That's kind of cool. What other things could we observe, talk about? Scales. Scales? Yeah, what kind of scales? Birds have scales on their legs. So think about this. This beak here probably is a bird feature. And this beak here is some kind of other dinosaur feature. These eyeballs are like way deep, hundreds of millions of years ago, vertebrate feature. Now we're talking about scales. Scales are kind of like, based on what we know now, a reptile-y thing. So what I think is really cool about this, and I want you guys to keep in mind, is every organism we see, whether it's extent, living, extant, living, or extinct, is that there's like all made up of a sequence of things. This animal and this animal both have a skull and backbone and eyes and the same brain structures. And the same. There's so, 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 so much they inherit. 
But then of course there's ecological specialization, body size things that make them seem really different. Interesting things like beaks might be different, but at the end of the day, right here, there's a scapula and a humerus and a radius and ulna and hand bones. And right there, there's a scapula and a humerus and a radius and ulna and some arm bones. This one flies and lives in the jungle. And this one's for millions of years ago and runs around like a giant rhino monster. But they still have the same limbs. The point is, is that all these organisms and every organism we see is kind of made of these mosaics of like added features. And what's really cool is being able to talk about, get into interesting stories, interesting evolutionary patterns of what's shared versus what's independently derived. So thank you guys for that exercise. These are the two fancy pants words that we've been building to this whole time. Homology. Homology is a similarity to be shared between organisms that due to their ancestry. The eyes in birds and triceratops are homologous. And so, for example, the wing of a hummingbird, which flaps a million times a second, the wing of an ostrich, which doesn't fly at all, they're still homologous structures, the bony structures of those wings. Those are homologous inherited from common ancestor. You might also have similarity like the beaks we just talked about, that's homoplastic, we say, or a homoplasy, a similarity that's real, something that is observable and tangible, but the similarity between the organisms is not inherited from common ancestors, they've independently derived it. Again, if we go back to your like high school biology book, a great example is always bird wings and bat wings. Birds and bats both use their forelimbs to fly. They do it in completely different ways. So yes, they have wings, but they're not shared from common ancestor that had wings. They both independently evolved wings. So that's homology. And that's homoplasy. These are some of these fancy pants words. And we can take those words and then put them onto our phylogenies to understand. So I dropped this word on that worksheet for you guys. You just saw it, a synapomorphy. Any one of these characters we can talk about, having eyes, having four legs, having a beak. There's this core word here, it's called apomorphy. Don't worry about that too much. Synapomorphies are shared apomorphies. Shared, but derived from common ancestor features. Synapomorphies are what build phylogenies. Here's some phylogenies here with some labels of like the ancestral trait or the derived trait. So we can think of this as like having eyeballs or having four legs. And a synapomorphy is a shared similarity that the common ancestor also has. There's other things, like we just talked about the homoplasy. Maybe the bird has a beak and triceratops has a beak, but their common ancestor does not. That's a homoplasy. Plesiomorphies are really interesting. Plesiomorphies are shared characters, but they're ancestral. Usually we use this word plesiomorphy when we're talking about um, paraphyletic groups. Reptiles share a lot of features. There's a reason you guys wanna put them in the same bin, crocodiles and turtles and lizards relative to birds, because they share like scaly features and like a stance like this. Those are real, you can observe those, but they're plesiomorphic. They're the old condition that keeps getting passed along until birds do something weird and different. Doesn't mean crocodiles and birds aren't more closely related. It means that there's a lot of plesiomorphic features that make us think Crocs and turtles and lizards all look like each other. These are some of the words we're going to be using. Again, I know it's like uh, vocab vomit on you guys today. That's why you have these slides. And hopefully as we move through class and you encounter them with real examples, these words won't be so scary and like whatever. So here's a really good example of homoplasy, of evolution, where you have similar features, but they're not inherited from a common ancestor. This is the actual, like to me, like juiciest part of this class going through earth history and talking about all the ways life has evolved and in some ways the patterns that keep showing up. You guys probably remember this because you've learned it before. Convergent evolution is what we call this like big old phenomenon of like many, many characters all evolving together in concert to produce a certain kind of body form, a certain kind of anatomy. These things don't have to be very closely related to each other to look really similar. And what's really cool is we can use modern biology, we can use fossils to pull apart evolutionary history and see that, oh my gosh, they might look similar, but they come from completely different places. This is a fantastic example. Here's a mammal. Its ancestors look like a little mouse possum thing. Here's a reptile. Its ancestors look like a lizard. Here's a bony fish. Here's a shark that's a cartilaginous fish. They all are doing some stuff. Talk to your neighbors about these four organisms. Same as the bird and the triceratops. What are they inheriting that's from a common ancestor? What are they inheriting that they've evolved on their own? And also just fun observations about these four organisms. Go ahead.
But they're all just sitting. One other thing is like the I know that yeah. I don't know about the Oh, that's right, because uh, the dolphin is the all right, what are some just like general observations people have? These are these are these animals here are like a classic, like literal textbook example of convergence. So what, what are some things you guys are talking about? They all have dorsal fins. But they all got dorsal fins. Dorsal fin, dorsal is like your back behind you, it's like up. For us, we're weird. We walk like this. Most animals, most vertebrates are like this. So a dorsal fin on your back. All, all the dorsal fins are triangular and slightly sloped back. What is the deal that these two fishes, this mammal and this reptile, all have like a thing on their back that's pretty much the same shape? That's that's something. Do we think that they all have a common ancestor and they all inherited a dorsal fin? Or do we think they independently evolved their dorsal fin? Yes. This dolphin is related to you. And the ichthyosaur is related to like T Rex. Well, maybe, well, maybe uh, possibly, possibly shark and marlin might have ancestrally had a dorsal fin, but not looking like that. It's not in that position, not in that. Shape. So, what does it say about the fact these are all open ocean, fast pursuit predators of little squids, well fish? They all have the same ecology. They all do the same thing functionally in the ecosystem. And evolution by natural selection has crafted this mammal and this reptile and these fishes to be like, Kind of the same if you squint. One example might be the dorsal fin. That means that reptile and that mammal had to evolve dorsal fins kind of from scratch. And guess what? They did. There's no bones in there. There's bony stuff in the shark one. There's bony stuff in the marlin. Those are lineages you guys are going to learn that have never left the ocean. But the mammal and the reptile just made up out of scratch dorsal fin. It's crazy. We'll talk about it. What else? Similarities, differences. brought up the difference between how their tail fin is oriented. Oh, okay, so what do you mean? So we have the ichthyosaur, the and the two fish have a kind of vertically aligned tail fin, and they swim side to side. The dolphin? The dolphin that swims up and down. That's pretty cool. Doesn't that make you wonder, what's the deal? If dolphins are so much like sharks and ichthyosaurs and marlin, how come they didn't get with the program and go side to side with their tails? There's something there. Evolutionary heritage is preserved in that way. It's super cool. Whales, dolphins, manatees, sea otters, any mammal that gets in the water does this. A lot of the reptiles that get in the water do this. And all the fishes have always been. Intriguing. Intriguing. Okay, what else? Breathing. Breathing. What about their breathing? How are they all breathing? Some have gills. <laughs> How is this shark oxygenating its blood? It's okay if you don't know shark anatomy, but I think you probably have some idea. Okay. 
Yeah, there's well, there's oxygen dissolved in the water. The shark passes water over its gills. The water comes out. It oxygenates its blood. This fish is doing the same thing. It's passing water over its gills. Is a dolphin passing water over its gills? No, there's no gills in a dolphin. Dolphin has lungs like you. Famously, a dolphin has to go. You guys have seen it, right? They have to go with the surface to breathe. Their nostrils on top of their head. They got to go get air at the top. The ichthyosaur is the same. We've never seen a live ichthyosaur before, but we have tons of ichthyosaur fossils. They've got noses like dolphins where they're kind of way up high on their face. They're reptiles. They don't have gills. So to breathe, that reptile is going up to the surface and going like a dolphin has to do. That's crazy. So the fact that these two have a very different heritage from these two means that the way they're breathing is very different. These two are probably inheriting the same thing from a common ancestor. These two both use their lungs to breathe. And now that they live in the water, they got weird holes on the top of their head to breathe while they live their water lives. Convergent evolution for sure. Homoplasy for sure. An ichthyosaur and a dolphin doesn't have a common ancestor that's living in the water and breathing air. They have an ancestor that's breathing air, but up on land. Super, super, super cool. Any other observations about these? Okay, yeah, we have one more. You're talking about live birth. Uh, oh, yeah, live birth. That was uh, the ichthyosaur evolved that after it got into the water, right? Ooh, hard to know because we don't have very many ichthyosaurs from before they go in the water. Mm -hmm. So you guys know mammals give live birth, right? Is that true? <laughs> Asterisk, platypus lays eggs. <laughs> plenty. There's a couple mammals that still lay eggs. Also, there's plenty of sharks that have live birth with a placenta. So it's messier than you think. But it's interesting, right? Different kinds of organisms having their reproductive behavior. So these two are both land-living animals that then evolved to live in the oceans. They both have their babies live. We have fossils of ichthyosaurs that you guys saw in class. They have their babies inside them still. Really cool. That ecology matches up with the dolphin one. We can see dolphins and see them as an analogy for ichthyosaurs. Super cool, right? All of the things you guys have just brought up, those are all characters. Those are all quantifiable, measurable, interpretable figures, things. I just want to make the point that there's tons of different kinds of characters. What we've been talking about right now has been a little bit of behavioral, mostly anatomical. But there's lots of other ways we can observe uh, characters of organisms and then use those in phylogeny. So how your physiology works, how you develop. One of the things that's really, 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 really great is that fossil whales show us whale evolution. You can also look at development of whales today. If you look at a little baby dolphin fetus, as it's growing, it grows four legs. And then it sucks the back legs in and the front ones become flippers. But for a second, it's got four legs like any of the other mammals. You can see that when it's a fetus and then that goes away. Just like when you guys were in utero, there's a time when you have a little tail and then it goes away again. So the history of organisms preserved developmentally. We can also look at things like their DNA, of course, their chromosomal structure. It's not just the pattern of DNA. It's not just the base pairs. Tons and tons and tons of features can be used to make characters. I know I'm hitting it over the head here. So it's going to be our, like, uh, I know you guys are getting there because it's been two hours. Our last little bit of, like, exercise and stuff. So this is going to be interpreting phylogeny, working, as, working for phylogenies as tools. So here is an evolutionary tree just like the one you saw before. You might not know what all these words are, that's okay. The color is brown if the animal lives on land, the color is blue if the animal lives in the water. So do you think that the common ancestor of all of them right here lived in water or lived in land, lived on land, and why do you think that? How would you use this phylogeny to try to answer that question? Go ahead and talk to each other. Oh, no. Okay, does anybody want to uh, share your answer? And I don't really care what your answer is. I care about why you think that's the answer. I'm not looking for a coin toss.
I just heard everybody answering. I heard you picking. Yeah. Well, if you look at the um, animals that are closest to the uh, common ancestor uh, of every animal here, those are all aquatic. Well, hang on. What do you mean by closest? So, for example, sharks and rays. I want to. I'm going to interrupt you. Just I'm doing it on purpose. So these animals are not any closer to this. The lineage is the same, like length in this dimension. So I know it can be really fancy to do the mountain lion, but that mountain lion is not any farther or closer to this node than the sharks and the rays are. Really, I know that's really hard. It's something that really gets people. You really want that to be true. And there's a lot of ways that it's interesting to talk about it like that. But in terms of like the real biology, these animals are all equally distant from this. Just to say. I'm sorry. You were onto something though. What were you what were you trying to say? Well, um, the most ancestral animals, the most basal animals are typically fishy, like one fish or coelacanths or okay. all the fish over there. Okay. It'd be safe to assume that the common ancestors probably had more in common with those than um, the land animals. But the bias has a, has a starting point. Anybody want to disagree? Anybody want to say land and tell us why they would think land? Raise your hands for water. <laughs> Everybody says water. Yeah. Uh, raise your hands for land. Nobody's saying land. So let's talk about it a little more. Uh, let's say we're trying to get after this uh, and, 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 and really use this tree as a tool. And I want to understand how some of these animals have limbs and some of them have fins. Some of the things I call legs and arms, a lot of them have things I call fins. I want to understand how that is. Let's say this is a phylogeny we're using and it's based on nuclear DNA. Really simple question here. Why is this phylogeny useful for studying limb evolution if it's actually a tree of DNA? And then I'm just going to use it to study limb evolution. Talk to each other for a second and decide between these. Oh. Or what? Yeah, what would make if you're going to be studying then with evolution? What makes this one based on DNA better? The limb can change based on like change that. Like, 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 I can make a phylogeny entirely based on how them. Yes. Would that be a useful thing? Close to study how that is. Oh, not exactly. Anybody have any thoughts on this? Any groups have any thoughts on this? Like using a DNA phylogeny to test an idea about limb evolution, why that would be important? Start getting the random call cards. <laughs> what are you guys talking about? Which one of these is even at all appealing to you versus not? All right. Like number one. Like number one. How come? Oh, okay. Other people did too. Yeah. How come? Um, because if you're just using one thing, like comparative anatomy, then you might be making assumptions about well, they must have worked this way because of this or that reason, but that might not actually be true. Sure. And the DNA evidence help correct some of the assumptions, the mistakes you might have made in the anatomy. Yeah, it might, right? It might. You definitely could make a phylogeny based on comparative limbs and fins and get an idea of the evolution of these animals. And it might not necessarily be wrong, but then you got to be really careful because some of these features, how do you know if they're inherited and they're the same or they're the same, but they come from different ancestors? That can be hard to pull apart. DNA is like an independent line of evidence. I'm gonna to decide to skip some of these questions right now because we are not, <laughs> I'm not feeling the energy for you guys, which is okay, it's late in the day. So if you had to put a tick mark on this tree, somewhere on one of those lineages, you have to put a tick mark. 
where you think maybe fins evolved into things we call limbs, where would you put that tick mark? Go ahead and talk to each other. Is the reason why you say that? Yeah, I mean, other than your like this, you've got so we could say that I kind of like where you have to find the form on the sea like yeah. So maybe just report something like to it and you can be part of the is anybody who's feeling who's feeling like they have an answer they're comfortable with? Well, what? Who's feeling like that answer to come with? Hannah, are you willing to come up here and touch the screen? Yeah. All right, Hannah, where would you put fins to, or yeah, fins to limbs? What do we think? Agree, disagree, different ideas. I might be inclined to disagree. Disagree. Okay, Jonathan's got a different idea. Where would you put it? I would put it. You come touch the screen. Okay. <laughs> right here, because sea orchids have limb-like features with their humerus. Oh, isn't that how nature always works? It sucks. So some fins these fishes have, have fins, but they're pretty limby fins. So what do we even mean by limb? So in, both, in either case, both groups so far, we got a tick mark here, we got a tick mark here. Anybody putting anywhere else on the phylogeny? Let's get another disagree. Where, where, what? So we're talking about where that split occurs. I'm talking about if you're trying to use this to interpret the anatomy of all these organisms, some of them have fins, some of them walk around on land, somewhere on here, if they're all related, these fins kind of become limbs. Where would we put that? We got one group saying here, the other group saying maybe more down here. One more. One more where? Oh, one more. Oh, there comes a screen touch. You got fins all the way up here. Yeah. Well, the quadrupeds here, it's going to be uh, somewhere on this vertical. On this vertical. So just so you guys know, right, this vertical and then this one horizontal right here are the same lineage, right? This is all this. If you put the tick mark here, or the tick mark here, same thing. Same thing. You're saying what? What are you saying? At the node. At the node. And still limbs. But that would mean these are inherited. Right. Yeah, that's not right. That's salmon. I'd say the lower half. The lower half. Okay, so you guys are all hovering around here. I like that. I didn't do a very good job of like giving you any details. I didn't say, when is there a load bearing limb? I didn't say, when are there <laughs> fingers? All I said was fins the limbs. And so you somewhere in here, I bet you're kind of right. And so once you have that tick mark, it's inherited from a common ancestor. The limbs of this lizard, this chicken, this elephant, this human are inherited from a common limbed ancestor. That's what we call tetrapoda. I totally think that's true. Lungfish and coelacanths are kind of interesting. We're gonna talk about them. It's a bit of a gradient. Personally, yeah, I, I think this is a pretty good solid, like full sure limbs, but these guys are also kind of limby. What's kind of lame up there in the mammals? Unhelpful to our conversation. You guys were all cool with those whales? Didn't bother you at all? Well, Would you say whales have limbs? Giant. <laughs> they have bony, you know. That's what's cool though, right? Even Aristotle can find a whale and the pectoral fin of a whale has like a humerus and a radius and all that and a hand inside of it. And that doesn't look like a fish at all. So it's kind of like, oh. So you went back to fins? That's cool. We call them flippers in a whale, but whatever. All right, so just some things about constructing phylogenies. Um, I'll probably just put this up there. I'm not feeling like blasting at you guys more stuff. One thing I want to say is go back to this question that Tobias very helpfully answered. Um, how do we use this phylogeny to make this estimation, this inference of whether this node here, this common ancestor is on water and on land? It's really similar. You guys just kind of did it yourselves without realizing it, I think, with the fin to limb thing. So what you can do, one thing you can do, is take the observable characteristics of the living things, or the fossils, whatever your organisms are that you're studying, and say, okay, where do they live? Okay, these two live in water. Sharks live in water, rays live in water. Do I think that their common ancestor lived in water? 
or did they both independently evolve living in water? And maybe their common ancestor was on land. What do you guys think? Water. Water. Okay, how about, how about salmon and trout? How about salmon trout plus tilapia? How about salmon trout tilapia plus zebrafish? All of these nodes, you could make that inference. Do I think this lives in water or on land? Uh, what about this one? What about this one? What about this one? What about this one? And I bet you guys are going to be pretty comfortable being like, hey, fish live in the water and get irritated with me, <laughs> right? So, okay, so this, you think probably water. This, you think probably water. This clay down here is all these animals that have fleshy fins or legs. And these two, and this is what Tobias is getting after, these two sister to the other animals with leggy things also live in water. So you might optimize like humans and mountain lions and whales. Whales are weird, but I'll just blast through it. Land living mammals, land living, land living probably, probably land living, birds land living, with crocodiles, turtles are unhelpful, lizards land living. So you might be like, okay, here's where land living evolves. That's maybe where I would put fins and limbs. And so then when I get to here, I've got one lineage that says land and one lineage that says water. So maybe it's equivocal. And then the next one out says water. And you're like, oh, so it's probably water. And the next one after that says water. And you're like, okay. And then the next one out says water again. And that's how you can use phylogenies to get an idea, a guess, an estimation. And I'm going to actually go better than that and say an inference for how we get these uh, predictions. I didn't uh, really give you the full time of day there, Tobias, because you were right after it. Um, and so that's how we can use these trees, right? You guys can look at these characters to put a tick mark and expect where you can expect something to evolve. You can look at it to make inferences on things like habitat. Last thing I want to say to you guys is like, I'm going to skip that for now, is like phylogeny is a really important tool. So circling back to like the very beginning of this lab that we all just started. This is the world that Linnaeus and, you know, Aristotle are in. There's organisms all around them. They can look at them. And try to make sense of what they're looking at. And it's just really incredible to me that we can understand evolution and like unlock all these really incredible stories that are not just like made up, they are themselves testable. They can be used to answer other questions. You can take the DNA of this organism and the DNA of any of these organisms and get an estimate for how old this node is. Then you can go to rocks that are that old and see if you find fossils. It's really, really, really cool. There's ways that phylogeny really underpins so much of what we know about biology. They are not just the stories of the relationship. They are like themselves like testable tools, which is really fantastic. And so you guys have seen this before many, many, many times. Something I'll emphasize to you is that when you see phylogenies, please remember, even in textbooks, these are like our state of knowledge at the time. Certain things I'm super, super, super competent in. Certain things are currently like under review and people yell at each other at conferences. And you guys are scientists, so I think it's really important for you to like keep in mind, our knowledge is always evolving. Nothing's ever like absolute guaranteed for sure. Do I think mammals are a monophyletic group? Yeah. But as a scientist, you have to be like, maybe someone's going to show me some evidence someday that they aren't. You don't know. So it's really, really, really important. And what I think is really cool is that not only are we getting really good at this, but there's like all these complications we're learning about. You guys heard in those lectures I posted on YouTube about things like endosymbiosis and things like lateral gene transfer. So if you work on lizards, that's easy. But if you work on bacteria, it's insane because they just give each other parts of their genome for no reason. So how can you make a phylogeny of bacteria? It can be really hard. I just like to like drop that on you because humans are doing our best and we have a lot of really good tools, but we're still like building and building and building all the time. Okay, enough of my like preaching stuff at you guys. That's what I have for phylogeny today. These slides are all up on Moodle for you. Please keep your worksheets. Please keep your notes. I hope all this vocab becomes more accessible as we actually use it in real examples. Cool.